Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we're delighted that you have brought us into your home. We would love to hear from you today during this live show, so give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205 271 2980 and you can always send us an email Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Well today we have a great guest Dr. Thomas Hilders and he'll be here with us today. He is the director of the Pope Paul VI Institute PopePaul6.com. You could go right to his website and we are excited about the conversation that we are going to have and he's wonderful. We have some uh, guests that are going to call in that we're excited about mm -hmm. who um, who went to them got some great counsel advice and they followed it and they yeah. have a beloved child and Dr. Hilders and that Institute have been used to bless so many people especially women um, speaking about the true transmission of human life uh, the fertility cycle we will be speaking about sensitive matter today so if you have some children you may or may not want them to to listen in, it won't be all that descriptive, but we're going to deal with this whole area of transmission of life and conjugal love. And uh, thinking about the psalm last Sunday, especially about Dr. Hilders and the Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He mm -hmm. leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear evil because you're with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. And so on. That that little lamb, that, that, that sheep is boasting, saying, you know, God's my, God's my shepherd. Mm -hmm. and, and the shepherd is absolutely critical. It's life or death for that, for that little lamb. If you're a bad shepherd, it's bad for the lamb. Mm -hmm. If you're a hireling, as Jesus said, there are hirelings. They don't defend the sheep. They run away from the sheep when danger comes. And, and Jesus was saying, I, I'm the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. I'm no hireling. Mm -hmm. But I lay down my life for the sheep. So I think Psalm 23 is, it's got to be in the top three of everybody in terms of our favorite psalm. And I'm thinking about Dr. Hilger's right thinking in the field of medicine mm -hmm. to truly understand true femininity uh, the human person the preciousness of the human person and the paul the sixth institute which is in many ways based upon the document uh, umane vitae by paul the sixth and joy you know we've i've written uh, a, a document it's called the study guide to umane vitae it's it's offered after each show and it's, it's a beautiful thing because the document is there itself there's a study guide that goes with it we trace in the teaching of Paul VI that as he declared uh, what is licit and not licit in terms of, of the sexual relationship should be between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, should be total in terms of the giving of oneself, unitive and procreative, a and that which is right for the transmission of human life, mm -hmm. for the human person. And this uh, really touched Dr. Hilgers when he read this you know, almost 49 years ago because we're coming up on the 50th anniversary. And Paul VI, when he gives this teaching, he says to scientists, it's, it's in the book, he says, I'm calling upon you scientists to work upon this, to do research, to study fertility and, mm -hmm. and, and the cycles and when a woman can get pregnant and when she can't get pregnant and, and the use of these cycles to conceive children or for a period of time abstain. And Dr. Hill just took up that call. And Paul VI also addresses doctors as well as researchers and scientists. He says, if you're a doctor, you're a nurse, be familiar with this mm -hmm. way of, of natural family planning and be able to give good counsel to people that are coming to you, that are trusting in you. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Hilder is, is outstanding both as a doctor and a researcher, and many of you will be very blessed today. Well, and you know, we encounter it on a daily basis also at the Pregnancy Medical Center. And it, it is representing everything that is true and holy and right. And it's an educational experience because some of our clients, they don't understand anything about their cycle and they don't understand anything about their sexuality. And so we get to represent it in a beautiful way um, of just trying everything that we have 
to set this culture in the culture of life and to take away all the forces of the culture You're of death from it. You're being a good shepherd. Trying. It's not just the Lord is our shepherd, but mm -hmm. if you have responsibility as a, as a mom, a dad, a husband, a wife, a business person in the field of medicine, you are in a sense a shepherd and you need to know your sheep and you need to be about the natural law and what God teaches and divine revelation that people might experience that true abundant life. Dr. Thomas Hilders, the Pope Paul VI Institute is here. It's Pope Paul V1 for six, Pope Paul V1.com. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you today during our live show. So if you have a question for our guest, Dr. Tom Thomas Hilgers, you just give us a jingle during the live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. And you can always send us an email, Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. And hopefully we will use your question or your comment right here on the air. Well, it is our pleasure and privilege to have you with us, Dr. Hilders. We are excited. And we've heard about you for years. We've seen you on EWTN. I think the last time I saw you, you were on Jeanette's show. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're familiar to our family yes. at home at EWTN. But why don't you tell our family at home a little bit about yourself, your personal life, your marriage, your family, where you were <laughs> educated, and then how did all of this start for you? Well, first of all, it's great for me to be back, and I'm really happy for the invitation. Um, well, let's see, I've been married for how many years? Oh, my wife would kill me. <laughs> 45 years, something like that. We have five children, seven grandchildren, but they're all granddaughters. Mm -hmm. So we got to get working, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, it all got started when Humana Vitae was published, actually because uh, when I was in medical school, I, I, uh, I was somehow interested in these issues, I don't know why, but, uh, and I kept reading about the commission that was releasing information, and I came thinking they're gonna change the church's position, so that's kind of what I was expecting. Then when Humana Vitae came out, and it was um, an amplification, really, of the church's long-held teaching, mm -hmm. and, um, so I thought to myself, I should really get a hold of a copy of it and read it because I didn't believe then even what the news people were saying about mm -hmm. things. So yeah. anyway, I, uh, I did do that. I, I, I had to tell you though, I went to the Newman Club chaplain at the University of Minnesota and asked him, where do I get a copy of Humana Vitae? And his remark to me was, what do you want to read that kind of trash for? Mm -hmm. So that was my first encounter. Mm -hmm. But I did get a hold of it, and I read it, and I was instantly converted. It's a, it's a magnificent document. People don't realize how magnificent it really is, because uh, one thing the church hasn't done a really good job of is, is teaching people about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things that really struck me at the end of there is three parts to Humana Vitae, actually, and the third part is what's referred to as the pastoral directives. Right. And in the pastoral directives, Paul VI called for seven different groups to become involved, he identified mm -hmm. them. And two of them I related to, one was men of science, mm -hmm. one was physicians and healthcare professionals. And I had already done some research while I was in medical school, so I thought I should be able to do something like that maybe. Mm -hmm. So I started actually in 1968 with my first wow. little research project. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe it's coming up on 50 years oh, next yeah. July, be 50 years of Umane Vitae. When you read the document, in terms of your understanding at that point in your life as a Catholic, uh, you're in med school, whatever's going on with you, was this, was this for you like you, you understood that was there? This was your understanding already? Was it something new in it? What touched you and exploded in you to make you want to carry this? What was your impression of it? Yeah, well, my impression was very positive. And what I've told a lot of people is that I read, oh, I read the whole thing, of course, but paragraphs maybe seven to 11 or 12, something like that. I don't remember the exact paragraphs, but it's early in the document. 
And it was just uh, teaching what the church had always taught. And it didn't even mention contraception or abortion or anything. It was about marriage. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I believe in that. <laughs> so I already knew why it was that they couldn't do, they couldn't change. Mm -hmm. right. Because what was being said was so important. It was literally the, the foundation of marriage. It was the foundation of family. It was the foundation of having children. All of those things put together. Yes. And so contraception wasn't going to fit into that equation. Right. And yeah, Paul the Sixth really speaks about <clears throat> this being written in natural law. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's uh, underlined through divine revelation. But he was saying, if I recall correctly, that uh, you know this is not something that this is in the created order. Yeah. It's not even that we've written this up right. in terms of the church yeah. doing it. We're seeing what's going on here. This is etched in the natural order, and we didn't make the teaching, and we can't take the <coughs> teaching away. This is how human life is transmitted yeah. through this conjugal union, this conjugal act, the unitive, right. the procreative, the gift of totality. Therefore, we, we can't change this. And it really sounds to me uh, like it is a perennial, definitive teaching of the church. Well, I've actually thought that for a long time. And uh, as far as uh, fertility is concerned, we, we've kind of gotten this notion that fertility is a disease. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a paper given before Planned Parenthood many years ago by a Planned Parenthood doctor whose, whose title of which was Pregnancy, the Second Most Common Venereal Disease. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, fertility is not a disease. Fertility is something that's normal and healthy to us. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can go wrong. It can, you can have infertility, you can have miscarriage, all sorts of other things can happen, but that's not basic fertility, that's abnormal fertility. That can be treated and effectively treated, I might add. Uh, but it's sort of like thinking of your thumb. If you're gonna, you don't like your thumb all of a sudden, I'm just gonna get rid of that baby. Mm -hmm. I can get along fine with four mm -hmm. fingers. No, you won't get along so well. Mm -hmm. And, um, what, what our challenge is, is to learn about our fertility, understand it, and then to uh, be able to learn to, to live with it, but live with joy and with happiness and, and glory, really, of what this gift is that we've been given. Well, at the time of the writing of Umane Vitae, we were discussing at that point the rhythm method. Yep and maybe that is still rhythm is, is a part of the overall understanding, I would think, but yeah. where have we gone from that time of the writing of Umane Vitae in terms of fertility, understanding, yeah. and unleashing, as you say, the power of understanding that fertility? Yeah, well, you're right. It was a calendar rhythm method that anybody knew at that time, and they did submit, they had an organized effort to submit uh, letters from married couples and they were all upset with rhythm, which, which is understandable because it wasn't a very good system. Mm -hmm. but, but it did tell us that there were certain things that were inscribed in our creation that were important and that fertility, in fact, was a normal, healthy process. We just didn't understand it very well. Well, what's happened in the last 50 years is there's been an incredible increase in our understanding of this, our ability to teach people how to live with their fertility, understand their fertility, make good and healthy decisions mm -hmm. with regard to their fertility. And um, now we have, like, we have 280, 300, I'm sorry, 320 fertility care centers all over the United States. Mm -hmm. We're on six continents. Mm -hmm. um, we've trained 700 doctors. We've trained 3,000 teachers. I just got back, and in fact, the other day I finished a class that we had at the Institute with uh, people from 12 countries and, and 17 states. And they're all coming here, with, coming to those courses with great joy and enthusiasm. I just have never met people like this in my life. It's just, they are so incredible. And these, these are going to be the new teachers, the mm -hmm. new doctors. Mm -hmm. so it, because in med school, this is not what they're teaching. Never taught right? about, not one bit. And so all you're taught is to write a script. That's right. And give her something for depression, give yeah. her something for her fertility, yep. put her on birth control, and instead of all of the beauty yeah. of the Creighton model and to have that explained. Yeah. And so it, you're out there educating. So doctors have to come to you to get this education yeah. so then they could go back throughout the world and represent it. Right, exactly. And I always tell people that the revolution that occurred in 1960 when the birth control pill came out went so fast because mm -hmm. all you really needed was a prescription pad mm -hmm. and have an MD behind your name. Mm -hmm. um, and so it went quickly, but our, our challenge is much greater than that because we have to educate people. Mm -hmm. and so and not only that, we have to train people to, to know what to educate people right. in. It's a whole mm -hmm. different world out there now. Right. 
And it's a great challenge and it's a great joy to be able to be involved in this effort. And so I'm, I'm pleased by that and I think that, um, that, that the growth of this is way beyond anything I could have ever imagined when mm -hmm. we first started our efforts in this. I, I just can't tell you. Uh, EWTN had something to do with that too because mm -hmm. they yeah. <laughs> got the message out a little bit. Mm -hmm. So Doc, it's what so are beautiful. the key elements that are part of the Pope Paul VI Institute? Because we're talking and we're sharing. I mean, I know some of what you're alluding to, mm -hmm. but I, I would say the vast majority of people you know, in, in our country, in the world, maybe even in the church, don't get what you're saying or right. what's the difference. You know, you're talking about getting in touch with fertility so you can have a child or postpone <coughs> having a child. What is, isn't that contraception? Isn't that helping that along? I mean, what, what's so bad about this? Or what are your components? What's your philosophy? What's your foundation? Yeah. Well, the day that Pope Paul VI died, which is August 6, 1978, is actually the day that my wife and I looked at each other. <laughs> Sorry. I get really emotional mm -hmm. about this stuff. Mm -hmm. I know what my daughter's saying mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she always gives me a hard time about that. But it is, uh, we literally looked at each other and said, we're going to build this institute. Everybody said it would be a big failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was eight years before we could open it, seven. Yeah. And it was, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. We've been in existence now 31 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as a result of this whole effort, this new women's health science of NAPRO technology, natural procreative technology, where we look for the root causes of the underlying problem, mm -hmm. we develop treatments that treat those root problems. We're not putting on people on birth control pills right. to cover it up. Mm -hmm. If you have menstrual cramps covered up, if you have endometriosis mm -hmm. covered up, it goes on and on and on like that. And uh, so it's a, it's a, it's really a whole new way of looking at women's health. It's a whole paradigm shift actually mm -hmm. in women's health. Mm -hmm. And it'll take a while for everybody to be aware of it because it, the medical students or medical schools aren't mm -hmm. much interested in it. They don't care about the science. It's very interesting because there's strong science that supports this. And nobody in most of these schools really gives a darn about it. Mm -hmm. And it tells you something about all this stuff they talk about, you know, and I'm the I'm I'm the new guy for for women's health and all this mm -hmm. stuff, and and it's it's not so much the case. The women's health has suffered more than ever in the last mm -hmm. 50 years mm -hmm. uh, because of contraception, abortion, in vitro fertilization, all of these things. Mm -hmm. We have answers to all of that now. Mm -hmm. Now, for what happens, so let's say a doc who's had an epiphany and a great understanding mm -hmm. that, gosh, this is the way to go. But he's in a group, or she's in a group, mm -hmm. with other docs that are r writing prescriptions, yeah. and they really don't want to go this way. Yeah. What does that doc have to do? Well, they can stop prescribing. That's not a, mm -hmm. That by itself is not so much the issue, but it is difficult to work in a group where people don't, uh, don't see your way or don't mm -hmm. agree with it. They're also the ones who don't look at the science of it, don't look at anything really that would help th their foundation. Mm -hmm. So it goes in many different directions. I've had some who've stayed in the group and continued to be a witness, some who have uh, have not been able to stay in the group and had to go off on their own and, mm -hmm. and you know, combine up or, or come together with other doctors mm -hmm. who are more of like-mindedness. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different ways that you can go about it, but they don't usually go backwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's impressive, I think. Yeah, especially in the Catholic <laughs> community, you know, mm -hmm. when you say, I'm a pro-life doctor. Well, what does that mean when you're a pro-life doctor? So as you're training mm. and you're discipling men and women, when they, when they take that tag, I'm a pro-life doctor, what does that mean for them? Usually it means that they're against abortion. Mm -hmm. And they haven't thought much further than that. Mm -hmm. And they don't think contraception um, is a part of that whole issue because they think contraception is the answer to abortion. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of data now available that says that contraception just leads to more abortion. And they have to look at this data. They have to start using their scientific brains instead of the emotion of it mm -hmm. all. And you also have to want to really help people. And that, that's a little bit more work mm -hmm. than writing a prescription sometimes. Mm -hmm. it, but it's really glorious work. I mean, I, not a day goes by that I don't have something really important happen mm -hmm. that's really special in my life mm -hmm. with this work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and other people, too, who are being trained in it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting. You're saying... Um, <clears throat> Abortion really does follow contraception. Mm -hmm. And we see this at our medical center so frequently. I'd say maybe 75% of the women who come in, you know better than I do, Joy, but would say that they're on some form of contraception 
and that it's failed. There is a failure rate, and it's a larger failure rate if you're not using these things right. But they, they really feel like this is a wrongful conception when it takes place. Yeah. But this, this child is yeah. wrongly conceived. We were right. working against this exactly. conception. Therefore, this justifies we didn't want this, and that, that's their rationale. It is. Now, they're not thinking through it totally. They no. haven't seen the baby. That's what we're trying to do there, to say, let's get an ultrasound. Let's, let's talk about this. Let's you know, take a look at what we're doing here. But you're so right that, that <coughs> wherever contraception is implemented, throughout the world, abortion follows after it because it's wrongful. And just that term, against conceiving, yeah. against yeah. contra yeah. Yeah. conceiving, against conception. Therefore, if we conceive, then and it says in our, in our laws now that we must have abortion because we rely so heavily in America on contraception, they must have this option, you know, read killing the preborn child. Right. Um, how is NF, natural family planning, uh, different than contraception because even with pro-life people sometimes they say well NFP is contraception <coughs> anyway so we're, we're for life but we still use contraception yeah. and what you're telling me it's the same thing how would you what would you say to them well in the Creighton model system the couples learn when they're fertile in a cycle and when they're not fertile in a cycle so if they want to get pregnant they don't have to stop using it they keep using it and they can become pregnant so that, in a way, in a simple way, explains the difference. You don't take the birth control pill to get pregnant. You don't mm -hmm. take an IUD because you get pregnant. You don't use a condom because you want to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. So that's a simplistic kind of difference. But uh, once women and th their husbands, especially, oh, it's amazing what husbands do. They, they get to learn about their fertility. They're part of this as well. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not that they're foreign to it all. And they see it, and they see the miracle of it. And it changes their heart to mm -hmm. a great extent. It's mm -hmm. amazing. And, um, and this is something that we, we, we can't let go of. We have, to, we have to make it better and better for people, and, and it's really terrific. Okay, when, you, when you say understanding mm -hmm. a woman's fertility, please just explain to us simply what you're speaking about scientifically. Well, with the Creighton model system, uh, we're teaching uh, couples how to uh, observe the mucus patterns that occur around ovulation time. These are natural occurring discharges that are always there. They've been there since the dawn of women. And uh, now we know how to interpret that. We, we have a universal language to describe it all. And so we can identify those days that are not fertile. And we can identify those days that are fertile. And so really what we're teaching couples is to make good and healthy decisions. And, and this is completely consistent with Humana Vitae, incidentally. Mm -hmm. Humana Vitae says that responsible family planning is very much in the, should be in the hands of the married couple, not the government or or a variety of other mm -hmm. people, uh, doctors, for example. And so by, by learning all of these things, they can make uh, really good decisions on whether to have another child or, or perhaps it's a time in their life where they can't have another child and they can make a decision not to have a child at this point. Um, it's not contraception at all because you're, you're actually not doing anything to make it worse. In fact, what, what happens because they learn about their fertility, they may actually identify some abnormalities that they didn't know existed, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. can, with medical treatment, you can overcome those. And we have we have situations now where you can be treated and never have a miscarriage ever again, mm -hmm. even though you probably would have miscarried almost every pregnancy. Right. So for the first time, we can treat this as it's discovered before they're pregnant, and then they can they can get pregnant and never have to suffer through a miscarriage. It's really really impressive. Well, you know, we've, um, we're going to take a break, and then we'll come back. We'll finish our great conversation. We're having a wonderful conversation with Dr. Thomas Hilgers. We want you to be a part of our show. So we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So if you have a question today for Dr. Hilders, we want you to give us a jingle. Maybe you've heard about him, you've known about the Pope Paul VI Institute, and you said, well, look, here he is, you can talk to him. Give us a jingle at 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we'll use your question or your comment right here on the air. Doc, what kind of situations and mm -hmm. patients you know, ask for your help, ask for the help of the Paul VI Institute. Are, are there patterns to that? Or what yeah, are they looking there for? are. Um, we really specialize in the care of reproductive age women, uh, the women who have been treated with birth control pills forever and ever for the last 50 or 60 years. And that includes anybody with severe menstrual cramps caused by endometriosis, for example, polycystic ovarian disease, um, uh, all sorts of types of abnormal bleeding pelvic adhesive disease, we've developed surgical procedures which we can do surgeries now without getting a lot of scar tissue, which is really important mm -hmm. because infertility is a big group, uh, recurrent miscarriage, people who have um, a whole variety of other reproductive issues actually that we can uh, look for the problem, identify the problem, then treat it effectively. Mm -hmm. Now we're never 100% successful, but there's no program in the world that is. And I will only say this, and that is if you're doing IVF or NAPRO technology, you gotta decide which one's mm -hmm. gonna find a cure. Mm -hmm. And IVF won't because right. it's in not even looking. In vitro fertilization? Yeah, right. I'm okay. sorry, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> in vitro mm -hmm. fertilization, mm -hmm. test two baby stuff, but they don't even look for the problem. Right. I can't tell you the number of people who come to see me who are so frustrated because they can't, they can't um, well, so get you're, their you're doctor saying to pay attention to what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. A couple can't conceive, or maybe they're not a couple, she just wants to conceive. And you're saying that lots of times they're not looking at the why to that, and mm -hmm. they're going right to in vitro fertilization yeah. in a dish and, and combining the reproductive matter to create a human being there or several human beings yeah. that they'll implant yeah. and, and so on. So they're not looking for the root cause, and this person could really have a serious disease problem or something that will develop. It yes. could take her life. Mm -hmm. Yes. They're not looking for that. They're just concerned they, about, let, let's produce a baby. They frankly don't even care what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. They just go ahead and say, well, the only thing that's ever helped you to get pregnant is in vitro fertilization. Mm -hmm. And that's a highly abortive technology. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they come to us and we find out the problem. And we, if, there's two things. It's a kind of a win-win situation. They get their health problems treated for sure. And then they have um, a really good chance of having a successful pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Better than IVF, incidentally, by quite a margin. Right. Yeah. And with following the teachings of the church, yeah, not going against their teachings of the church. But if you think church. of the teachings of the church, I've always thought about this about morality, good morality. Good morality has got to be good medicine, mm -hmm. or good medicine has to be moral. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's all, I mean, everything that Paul VI talked about was, and he didn't always use this word, but it's all based on, not based on, but it is good health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so why would you want to put somebody on birth control pills and give them a risk of a blood clot in their right. lungs and die? Mm -hmm. And then it just keeps going on, you know, all mm -hmm. the list of things mm -hmm. that can happen that are, are not good. But they've all rationalized all this stuff. It's, it's extremely frustrating. We have Valerie on the phone. Valerie, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Dr. Thomas Ilgers. Hi, Jim and Joy and Dr. Hilders. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, just last month, I had my third miscarriage, and um, it was kind of a shock. I was uh, around 18 weeks pregnant. Um, but um, someone had told me about a doctor up in Tennessee, Dr. Paul Gray, um, who helps women with repetitive miscarriage, and I heard he was very pro-life. But um, I did not know until my husband and I went up there that he was actually Catholic and a NAPRO doctor. Mm -hmm. And that, that was just such an amazing thing to find out. Um, but anyway, so we went up there actually to deliver this baby. Um, and so Dr. Gray um, had me to be induced and deliver the baby there mm -hmm. and, um, you know, did some, um, took some samples of the placenta to do genetic testing and stuff. And, mm -hmm. um but I just wanted to share just what an incredible experience the whole thing was um, and just the care that I received during such a, a difficult time was mm -hmm. um, just, just touched, touched our heart. Um, 
Um, and I mean, it makes such a huge difference when life is valued somewhere yeah. and you could tell that everyone there, I mean, I think Dr. Gray, but also even all the nurses and the ultrasound tech and everyone just seemed to have this passion for what they were doing mm -hmm. and for life, even from, you know, its smallest, you know, even from conception and, um, we were just really blown away by the beauty of of the care that we received. And that, um, yeah. that so, was, go ahead, yes. finish. Well, I just wanted to say um, how grateful I am. And I mean, I really can't even express mm. just how grateful I am mm -hmm. for what you're doing, Dr. Hilders, and what, all, what these other doctors and, you know, just my experience with Dr. Gray, just so grateful because, you know, it's such a painful thing, um, mm -hmm. miscarriage and infertility. And I, I know it's because it's, it's such a powerful thing, God creating life inside of us. Um, and, um, you know, I know Jesus has a passion for this and he is working through your hands and through the hands of these doctors who are, who are doing this. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Valerie, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank We're you. so sorry for your loss. We thank you for your beautiful <coughs> testimony and witness. And now we know why you get choked up, mm -hmm. right? Because, yeah. and, and this is a, a case here, you know, which isn't all about science. This mm -hmm. is a case, what we spoke about at the beginning of the show, about being a good shepherd, right. about being a good doctor shepherd, yeah. about, about how you minister with dignity to people and understand mm -hmm. the sanctity of this, this child. So this is the other end of it where you can't make life come forth, heal something. This child passes away in the womb, yeah. but he's present yeah. there. Yeah. Well, a doctor's attitude, like, like anybody that you meet or know, uh, really makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. and so many of these doctors, I mean, they've bought into the culture of death. Mm -hmm. um, you, they would be very upset if I were to say that to their face, which I probably have on occasion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's horrible what they do. Yeah. It, I, it, just, I, it just offends me so deeply. Uh, and about Dr. Gray, he's a very good obstetrician, gynecologist, and he did study with us, so I'm very mm -hmm. pleased. Good. And just think, because you said yes, you and your wife said, we're going we're gonna to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one of the very wise things that you said was that this is going to take time. Yeah. But we're going to do it, and we're going to keep on doing it. It's just like us at the Pregnancy Medical Center. We're in this till our dying breath. Yeah. Because, first of all, God wants us to. And the culture needs this. Absolutely. And like you just think of Valerie on the phone. I mean, here's a mom. She had an 18-week-old mm -hmm. dead baby. Uh, and so she really needed, she, what was she, what was she going to do, you know? And how the care mm -hmm. and the, because you're so fragile. Mm -hmm. and But the care and the love that yeah. your doc had given. Yeah, no, I, I'm really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. for her. Joe, let's take another email. Okay, it says, thanks to Dr. Hilders and his NAPRO methodology, he was able to diagnose a blocked fallopian tube and more endotermesiosis, even though prior tests and surgery had been done with another doctor. Mm -hmm. So two months later, after major surgery, we conceived our little Joseph, who is <laughs> now seven years old. Mm -hmm. A miracle. And we are so thankful to Dr. Hilders mm -hmm. and the Pope Paul VI Institute. And this is from John and Claudia from Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, I know them. <laughs> so beautiful. And, and you know, we, we know Joseph. We get to behold him. Yeah. And that's just fruit of your ministry. Well, it is. And uh, children are really special. The, in in Humanae Vitae, Paul VI says that children are the supreme gift of marriage. Mm -hmm. And if you want one phrase, mm -hmm. that's it. Yes. Supreme gift. Just think about that for a moment. And uh, when you talk about being pro-life, well, that's, that's the supreme right. gift you're, right. you're defending. Right. Tell us about your institute, the staff that you have mm -hmm. there. Are they in other places? You have other facilities? How does this work? Where can people go? We have an overall staff of about 60 people now uh, in a relatively small facility. It's about 17,000 square feet of space, so it's not very big. When we first started there many years ago, we didn't even occupy uh, maybe a one and a half floors or something of it. It's three four little three-story building. Now we, we're bulging at the seams, and we have, occupy the whole building, and we have 
some of our faculty live uh, in other states and they come in for our education programs. One of the things we really would like to accomplish, uh, it would be even great if we could celebrate it during the 50th anniversary of Humana Vitae, would be to be able to have the opportunity to build a new facility because we're just so cramped and we believe this work has to go on. I was, like we were surprised when we went to your website, frankly, because yeah. I was picturing this big hospital yeah. and I said, is this the facility? Not that it looks nice, but, no, I, said, but I hear all the work that's going on. How could yeah. this possibly right, be? Right, right. Well, we do work in another place yeah. in the yeah. hospital yeah. for our yeah. surgeries, right. but sure. uh, it'd be great to have our own hospital even. Mm -hmm. But we need much better facilities. There's no question about it. The building is getting older and it's way out of date. We just have to get um, we have to get better equipment. We have to get more more space. We have to get uh, we we have people coming from all over the world, literally, mm -hmm. to study with mm -hmm. us. We just had three doctors from South Korea with us, mm -hmm. and and they'll want to come back and and learn some of the surgical techniques that we've developed. Mm -hmm. So well, we just can't do all of that with what we currently have. So, Joe, let's we're hope we can do that. We have Elena on the phone. Elena, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Dr. Thomas Hilgers. Well, I, I wanted to know, because I live in Southern California, and I wanted to know if there is a, a particular doctor that you can recommend for, a, for a, like a fertility doctor. My um, daughter, you know, she tried IVF for three times, but it, it didn't work. They, she had endometriosis, and mm -hmm. they took it out, and, um, and then after that, you know, did you say for IVF. Did you say that she lives in California? Southern California. Southern California. Yeah. Well, Dr. Teresa Stiggin is one of our fellows who, who lives in Southern California, practices there. Dr. Amy Holmes is another one of our fellows. And she's up more, I think, around Fresno. But they're well trained and, and they would be happy to see her, I'm sure. When, and if you have trouble finding her, just let us know. Okay, thank you so much for your call. If people go to your website, do you have listings of various centers or where your well, physicians are? Well, not happy? yet. We do okay. have, there's a fertility care centers dot, no, fertility care dot org website that uh, has all the Creighton Model Centers. Okay. And they can usually connect to. Uh, we do have a website, of course, and one of the things that we have available also is direct consultation with us, and there's a place on the website that describe how to do that, and they have to send some medical records, and they mm -hmm. have to chart the Creighton model, because the Creighton model is all foundational to this work in mm -hmm. NAPRO technology. So, so, but, so let's just say there's a couple, mm -hmm. and, and they've had a real hard time with conception. Yeah. So they would contact you, but then you would, you would set up a protocol for them to follow. Well, with, they the, with Creighton, right? Yes, but they often have to come to Omaha for at least one or two visits. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had people from every state in the United States come to the Institute and mm -hmm. several foreign countries. In fact, Africa, Europe, Canada, South America, Mexico, mm -hmm. Australia, they're all over the place. Yeah. The word has gotten out. That's why uh, things like EWTN and, the, and all the social media stuff uh, promotes this a lot quicker than I ever thought it would. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Well, this show isn't going to make it any so. easier for you. Yeah. 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 Joe, let's take this email. It says, your success rate at achieving pregnancy mm -hmm. and treating other women's health issue are much higher than more well-known treatments such as vitro fertilization. Why do patients seek out IVF when they could much, have much better results with your methods? And this is Kenny from Rocky Top, Tennessee. Well, the only thing I can say about that is that um, it's the only approach to infertility that gets any publicity, for the most part, in the national media. And uh, it's almost like that's the only treatment for infertility, and so people just, and if they go to their obstetrician gynecologist, that's where they're going to refer them. Mm -hmm. So they think it's, uh, that's all there is available. Right. So our challenge to get it out and available to people, or at least knowledge about it, is, is a much a more difficult one, mm -hmm. but we take every opportunity we can to talk about it and, and get more out. And We've actually, with, with all of the people we've seen, we've never had a marketing program. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is because we don't have any money for it, but marketing is really gonna be important in the future as we grow and grow and grow, because we gotta really see that people have access to this. Yeah. Is it a false assumption that all Catholic hospitals know all about the Pope Paul, the Paul VI Institute? Um, uh, I was thinking of fake news right off the <laughs> bat, but uh, no, I don't know. I suppose they might have heard of it, mm -hmm. but they don't do much about it either. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a sad thing, actually. I, 
I, I've always been frustrated by the, the lack of a good um, outreach to just Catholics in general, mm -hmm. much less Catholic hospitals. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Catholic hospitals um, really should have uh, some of this work in their hospitals. Some of them are very, very good, and I don't mean to, you know, go after all of them, but, but they could be doing a lot more. Mm -hmm. Also, the, the Catholics in general, they don't even know what Humanae Vitae says. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the foundation of it. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely a magnificent document. I personally believe it speaks the truth. And not just because Paul VI, I mean, he was a pope. I was alive when he was a pope, but we never met him. We, you know, we just read his stuff mm -hmm. and uh, he was really tremendous. Mm -hmm. Doc, we have a couple of minutes left. In this area of education and what you're doing in the Paul VI Institute, how is this spreading? How is people coming to you? Are you encouraged that that there's really a move about regarding the culture of life in this way? Well, I think there is. Um, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to measure, but uh, the, the, just the fact that we have the internet, uh, which has its own problems, but at least for us being on the website, and our website's not the greatest, but it, it does get the word out. Social media has gotten the word out. Uh, we do train a lot of teachers and doctors, and they're all over the country and the world now, actually. And that's gotten the word out more and more. So, it, I mean, it's definitely growing and building. We just have, uh, there's so much more work to yeah. do. And that's why we're really, we're, in, we're training right now the next generation of doctors. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mentioned my daughter, Teresa. She's a, she just finished her fellowship at the Pope Paul the Sixth Institute and, and does robotic surgery and mm -hmm. all of the napper I hope she was treated work. very well. Then. <laughs> She's treated extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, you know, when we go to your website, you have a listing of the Creighton model, NAPRO technology, and you click on those, and then it seems like it's almost like a whole other website. Yeah. Do you find people coming to you that aren't Catholic, that aren't Protestant, more conservative, just secular people saying, I want to know more about NAPRO technology. I want to know more about the Creighton model. Yeah. I'm not religious, but yeah. I think this is holistic and it's healthy. Yeah. You know, there's a couple things about that. About 25% of the people who come to us are not Catholic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's a, it's a good sized population. Um, and I'm happy to see them. I have no problem with that at all. However, I must say that I would really like to um, make this proliferating in the Catholic community because if the Catholics would be able to see this better and be able to do it and see the benefits in their own life, yeah. they would then be able to proselytize mm -hmm. the whole world. I mean, it, 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 and I, I'm not saying that because I don't want to take care of anybody else. That's not it at all. But. I, I'm not a, for, at all afraid of, of being able to take care of Catholics. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hilgers, thank you so much for your yeah, great and prolific work in building a new culture of life. God mm -hmm. bless you, your thank family, you. this great work. May it ever grow deeper and expand more fully. Well, thank, thank you, you very much for having me. Thank you. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Father Leonard will be with us. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back. Well, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love for you to join us live right here at home and be a member of our studio audience. All you need to do is contact the EW, e, EWTN pilgrimage department. Just send them an email, pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Give them a jingle at 205-271-2966. Make your way to Irondale, Alabama. Make it a part go to Hansville, the shrine, and visit Mother Angelica's resting place. Well, right now we're going to go straight to Rome to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from Rome to everyone at home, and I wish I'd been able to spend a little bit of time in studio with you today, because of course I know Dr. Hilgers, and I've interviewed him in Rome for, for my radio show, Vatican Insider. And I have to say, the topics that you're discussing, natural family planning and so forth, only kind of make us think of next year's celebration of the 50th anniversary of Pope Paul VI's beautiful, but also controversial, encyclical Humanae Vitae. Now, of course, the Pope did three things in that encyclical. He reaffirmed the Church's decades-old prohibition of artificial contraception. 
he uh, approved natural family planning methods, and he also upheld the church's teaching on love and responsible parenthood. Now, these were tough calls in an age that really was marked by a sexual revolution, an age when birth control pills were everywhere and accepted, an event that eventually led to abortion being the law of the land and abortion being seen as a way of controlling births. Now, um, these were teachings of Paul VI were rejected by many people because they weren't, quote unquote, um, seen as signs of the times. Now, what's interesting about this, next year is the 50th anniversary, and I say, what will those celebrations bring? And I ask that because, interestingly enough, a four-person commission has been formed here to look into the Vatican archives documents that led to Paul VI actually writing Humanae Vitae. Now, this was never formally announced, and in fact, this commission was denied, its existence was denied by the Holy See. But then an online website got a hold of a confidential memorandum from the substitute Secretary of State, Archbishop Beichu, that spoke of this commission that actually the Vatican had to confirm its existence. Now, Archbishop Paglia, who's president of the Pontifical Academy for Life, he told Catholic News Agency the initiative was aimed at studying and deepening this encyclical but denied it was a commission whose purpose was to reread or reinterpret Humanae Vitae. So, but really, some people here are asking if this commission indeed is a campaign to challenge the encyclical's prohibition against um, artificial contraception. So, fascinating news from here, a story we're going to keep up with and uh, keep you informed. But that's it for today. So, back to you at home. Joan, thanks once again for your excellent reporting and your sharing with us this day. Father mm -hmm. Leonard, it's always good to see your face. Mm -hmm. Another powerful show today. Oh, yes, it's good to see you both as well. Yeah, very powerful show, and uh, I'm just amazed at the work that the Lord is doing through, through uh, Dr. Higgins and, uh, and the Pope Paul VI Institute. Mm -hmm. You know, this is very, very needed uh, today. You know, as priests, we, we speak to uh, many uh, couples mm -hmm. who are having, you know, fertility problems. And, you know, this is a great uh, resource for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this work needs to continue. And, you know, I ask those out there, you know, who, who are capable of supporting this endeavor to mm -hmm. please do. Mm -hmm. And as doctor was, uh, was pointing out that this, there's need of expansion from this, mm -hmm. right. you know, more publicity. So mm -hmm. those who can, who can do this, please support them. And then, you know, also uh, other Catholics, please spread the word about it. You know, they have a great website with a lot of information. You know, it's, it's amazing yeah. what, what God is doing through this. This show today and listening to Joan, we began with the Umani Vitae mm -hmm. spiritual guide. I hope everybody will get that spiritual guide to Umani Vitae. Yeah. It'll, be, it'll be advertised again because it has the document, mm -hmm. how to get into it. But this whole thing of Umani Vitae on human life, Mm -hmm. on the human being, mm -hmm. on the human person. How do we transmit life? Mm -hmm. How do we do what is best for this human being, for this person? Mm -hmm. Contraception is not best. Abortion, horrendous. Mm -hmm. How the child is conceived, the right to a father, the right to a mother, the right mm -hmm. for a husband and a wife to conceive a child in love. The right for that child to know that this child is irreplaceable. Uh, they're totally for him. They're, they're committed to the life of this child. How much is this right at the center uh, uh, of the world at this time? Mm -hmm. The negation of children mm -hmm. being against conceiving children. The mentality that this has developed. Mm -hmm. And this isn't to condemn. None of us is doing everything perfect. And in vitro fertilization, the way children are, are created, con conceived, and I know many people who've used in vitro fertilization, mm -hmm. their children are of equal worth and value than any other child, so we're not saying anything about a child conceived by in vitro fertilization, mm -hmm. but it doesn't justify the means. Mm -hmm. It doesn't lift up to that dignity and value the human person mm -hmm. when we're so dominating through science, mm -hmm. or we conceive numerous little children and, and we select which ones we want, put the others on ice, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or eliminate them. Mm -hmm. and, and church, wake up. Mm -hmm. And those of us who've committed sins, and I'm a part of that, nobody's done it perfectly mm -hmm. in the sexual area. And it's a very sensitive mm -hmm. show today. But the truth doesn't change for me. Mm -hmm. The truth doesn't change for you. Mm -mm. 
And children need to be at the center of our universe, of our world. We need to see the eyes through the eyes of a child. Unless you humble yourself and become like a child, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm, that's right. Jesus Amen. said. Yeah. And now, again, so I violated in some ways. Mm. I repent of that. Mm. And I want to be an advocate for this sure. other way. But this is right at the, at the heart. And I'm so glad to be Catholic yeah. that we have an answer for this and a solution for this and, and God's mercy for this that we can once again embrace a new culture of life. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, you know, it's important that we do embrace this culture of life because it, when we don't, there's always consequences to that. Mm -hmm. And as, uh, you know, uh, many years ago, about uh, 40 or 50 years ago, you know, when um, uh, Paul VI wrote the document, he wrote in there several things that would Prophetic. occur mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if, you know, we didn't abide by this culture of life and right. we didn't sanctify life. And all of that has come to pass, mm -hmm. you know, in, in different ways. And, you, you know, you see it today. You just see uh, a disrespect for life, you know, uh, people trying to control population, you know, eugenics and all of this stuff, mm -hmm. all on the rise, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Father, yeah. give us a, a prayer and a blessing that we would be strengthened to this end. Sure. Lord God Almighty, we ask you, Lord, for a greater love for life, God. And we also ask that, that you protect life, Lord. Give us your strength so that we could go forth to promote life, to glorify you, Lord. And may Almighty God bless you all with his strength and peace of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks so Thank much you. for joining us today. And this was indeed uh, a sensitive and beautiful subject that really deals with the human person. God's plan for you is for good and not for evil, to give you a future that is full of hope. May we all receive God's mercy and his truth and live it. God bless you and all of your loved ones. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.